go greetings and salutations all you lovely individuals we are back it's league unlock eric and mark here with you for a jam-packed weekend recap multiple best of fives in the lec the gauntlet run we said at the start of this it's time for the other teams to step up and raise the level of the entire region to really test g2 and what are we gifted with instead Three straight games in the finals where Fnatic are throwing away massive leads. Is this the lowest point for the LEC? Is this is this as bad as it gets? Because it's pretty darn bad at this point. I think even someone who uh, is as overwhelmingly positive, trying to look at that brighter side, give people the benefit of the doubt type of thing. This performance and what we saw out there on Summoner's Rift across the LEC, you know, pick your team, pick your players, it was not a good look. There's nothing you saw this weekend that you could be sitting there saying, I'm ready for EU at Worlds. I'm excited for G2 to get down 8,000 gold against Gen G and claw their way back from that. No, they, they weren't punished at all for having horrible early games most of the weekend. It, it, it's a problem where you look at how G2 played and you look at it as well, and what Fnatic was providing us that, you know, uh, pushback. Yes, there's absolutely some world where you can go into it and go, look at all those early advantages. That's, that's good from Fnatic, sure. But it comes with obviously the bitter aftertaste, uh, or, you know, kind of poisonous, fatal aftertaste of all the mistakes that come in the mid to late game that allow G2 to come through and take advantage and win the game. And it's not necessarily these mistakes where you're like, oh, wow, G2 is so good because they're able to capitalize on those mistakes, identify it, be all the... No, these are simply just, here it is, take the game from us, please, type of situations. And it is so abysmal to watch as a fan. I don't know how anybody was happy with this week just culminating and it surprisingly different ways Fnatic were able to blow these leads. You got losing a 4v5 after Caps randomly Valkyries into your whole team to die, proceeding to lose that around Baron, and I think it was 4k, 6k, 8k in that third game. The best early game. You've got like an 8 and 1 Noah on Ezreal, and then he just decides to kind of throw that all away. Arcane shift a little bit aggressively, but the fashion that they kept losing these, it felt like it had to be some deep-rooted mental issues for Fnatic against G2. Yeah, definitely. This is one of those situations where it is a, a, some type of mental block manifesting in that performance on how they're not able to get through, not able to have the confidence or, or whatever it is to make that final push to keep it all together. I mean, Noah's going to get a lot of criticism for this series, and I think you know, rightfully so with the performances that were served up and the advantages that you were given and, you know, partly earned as well in the early part and how they were thrown away and how carelessly you were moving around the map and making these choices in some of these fights. Look, I'd hate to do this, but bronze Ezreal players understand that if they make that arcane shift, well, okay, I'm, in, I'm putting myself in a trouble position because I don't have you know, that type of movement after that point when this, even with a flash, Noah decides to dial it up right in front of Caps and, and throw it away in front of the Corky. It, it is so many problems in this series when you look at his individual performance on it and the advantages that they had and where that then spelled out what type of fallout was going to be for the rest of Fnatic. Not to say that any of it else was picked up any of the pieces trying to put it together, but certainly Noah was a problem this weekend for Fnatic. Yeah, and listen, a lot of those early game leads they were getting in the straight up 2v2 bot lane. And yes, he has a lot of misplays, but I, I feel like the bigger issue here is how do you not know what to do as a team for Fnatic when you have such massive mid game leads to close things out? And what's strange about this whole summer split is you saw in the LCS Team Liquid and FlyQuest after all this international exposure, they came back leveled up they looked better and now the teams have to raise to their level to compete with them why did we not see that with g2 and Fnatic? we saw Fnatic for what two and a half weeks in the regular season where you maybe saw that level up but 
How did the LCS seem to learn so much internationally and EU took a step even further back? It's, it's strange. I think it actually is kind of part of it is the G2 effect on what they've been able to do internationally and how they've been able to rise up to that challenge, be fearless, all these type of things. I think absolutely the uh, North American teams that have gone up against it, been challenged, been beaten by G2 have learned to have that type of mentality, to take that edge with them back home. And that is certainly what we have seen from squads like Team Liquid as you laid out. But when you go on the other side, sure, you can head in and look at this series and find some type of winning killer edge with G2 that they do have, that elite teams have this ability to understand where they're going to find their moment, how they're going to get a strike back here, a strike back there, these type of things to keep yourself in it, even if you're not at your ultimate peak. But at the same time, to be able to not rise to that ultimate peak when it matters, when it is these pressure situations, these are the type of things that G2 has done for so many years. These are the type of things that the region leading champions do for their for their region. G2, Fnatic, none of that this weekend. Yeah, and I mean, G2 at least has the clutch factor, always has in, you know, a lot of these game series swinging uh, team fights. Even Caps wasn't that great this weekend, and he's a guy who's been incredible the bright spot through the entire year for them. He, I think he only played two games of not Corky the entire weekend. Uh, but yeah, Broken Blade, as we uh, kind of mentioned, he was probably the standout guy on G2 in this series just to give a bit of a positive angle, even though it was mostly uh, tank duty, both the Orn and, of course, the Mundo. He looked fantastic on give him his roses for it because I, who who raise your hand i don't see it because who out there was telling me that broken blade was gonna be a phenomenal orn player back on the tsm days because that was nowhere in sight for my man bb he has become really comfortable on that pick and the abilities that he has been able to put through in the top side and what that brings for g2 with that champion big time you don't get the the comeback yes of course without unbelievable and awful mistakes from Fnatic but Broken Blade and the role that he played in that game three that massive comeback from the deficit that Orn was a big time game clincher for G2 shot at redemption for the whole region we still have the season finals before we go to worlds but at this point i think most people are saying i, I don't even want to watch a lot of these games because they're so disappointing the level that we're at in eu right now total opposite side if you wanted an actual master class some perfect cinema from the weekend you had to be watching hanwa life versus d d plus kia especially that third game after trading back and forth kind of dominant wins this third game was 40 plus minutes of master class team fighting and god bless mr aiming 14 and 1 on the kaisa he just had a 14 kill game and the lone death is on this insane final team fight what a series he had though oh man pour one out for the homie oh my goodness <sighs> this is such a pain such a frustration for aiming i think any adc any really anybody who's played any of this game and has had a moment where you've popped off you've had the big carry game and unfortunately the one misstep not even a misstep really it just simply is a consequence of a team fight and you being a casualty well i'm sorry sir that's gonna be the end of the game that's all that it takes for a hanwa life this was a phenomenal series all the way through. I think you got that back to back, you know, you got that pushback from both of these squads that you wanted to be seeing. You wanted that tenacity from them, showing that they're rising up, trying to nip, you know, catch up to the heels of T of a T1, of a Gen G. I think they've already probably passed the T1 at this point from what we have seen from T1, but really trying to build up towards that monumental level that Gen G is at. This is certainly a series that can lead you to feel that way about both of these teams. Because yes, Hanwha Life is coming out, pushing on to the shoulders of D plus Kia. But D plus Kia is still keeping themselves above water in this situation. And are still one of these teams that you're 
uh, improving your opinion of them as we move through this later part of the summer split. Yeah, an absolute nail-biting loss to Hanwha, and as we've already alluded to, D-plus, two competitive series against the behemoth that is Gen G, and again, you're watching the LEC Finals this weekend, and then you see this series, which are your second and third best teams in the LCK, and you're thinking, the West has no chance at Worlds. It, it's like trying to understand and, you know, translate watching movies backwards. And all of a sudden someone says, what are you doing, man? And they flip over, you know, your old VCR. I don't know if anyone knows what those are anymore. And you stick it in and he goes, ah, there it is. English. Everything's fine. I understand. Everything's good. Yeah, the, very much so. The difference between the two products that we saw this weekend. And when you're looking at that LCK matchup, one of the best things in that one for me is talking about the jungle, looking at Lucid and Peanut. I think this is going to be one of those years where you look back at what Lucid is doing, obviously, for D plus Kia, and you're going to remember this as, oh, this is the beginning of a player that is, is going to hopefully blossom into something fantastic. But you're also going to remember these key head-to-heads, these lessons that he's going to learn from these un, you know incredible icons of the lck talking about peanut in the jungle you can look at canyon and the other matchups that we've had for him this has been a really great year and this is another series where you can look at that and see the progress that he has made the potential that he does have and still some of the lessons that he can learn from the veterans of the lck and again to draw the comparison we just said this feels like the weakest the lec has felt in almost a decade the LCK feels like it's at its strongest it's been, and it's already been the strongest region for multiple years because you watch that series, you go, oh my God, incredible. And then, of course, you're reminded about this little old team that's trying to have a perfect 18-0 regular season. Latest on the Rift is a swift 47-minute sweep against the Kwangdong Freaks. You get double MVPs for Pays, who has yet another deathless series and how about a little draven mid for chovy uh and and you know what if there's anybody that's gonna convince me about draven mid it probably could be someone like chovy and what he can do i'm still not exactly sold on it i'm still i'm not seeing the angle that everybody else is because i get it with obviously lucian and i get it with zary and even hey Let's throw our boy Insanity from the LCS in there and talk about Jin mid. I get that. I can see where these things can work. The Draven, I'm still not seeing it generate uh, enough of that pressure that I want it to be in the mid. 24 and 1 overall from Gen G. I'm ready for AD Timo mid out of Chovy. <laughs> I think this was his 60th unique mid lane pick or something. I'm uh, not quite at Faker's level yet, but definitely the next closest. But it feels like they can play anything at this point. It's pretty close, and I, I want to keep the competitive integrity intact, but I think at some point, maybe you consider it as Gen G to start putting out a, a Twitter poll or, or some type of something to figure out what Chovy can play, because you can have the confidence that whatever the heck it is, no matter how bad and mysterious it could be cooked up from this League of Legends champion pool, Chovy, he probably could win on it. You're a commit coming to you soon out of Chovy in that mid lane. Look up for them. Uh, so clean, cool for them. Not quite as clean for T1 against the bottom feeder in DRX, but this is at least feels like a classic T1 series because you have an absolutely sloppy, yucky, icky game one that's going north of 40 minutes, scraping by, but you clean things up real quick. Coma obviously had some harsh words for the boys because they cleaned it up in game two. It, it was more of a... a restructuring, reshuffling of the deck to reorganize it for that game two and absolutely dished out the cards nice and clean and we moved on to the next round was the way it was for team one. Yes, the first game against DRX is is kind of the this uh, classic middle of the road series for T1 where it is a struggle, it is an effort where you do realize they gotta dig down deep into it to find something to get it done across the finish line and then game two, is overwhelmingly in the favor of T1. They find a way to close it out. This is another good, important win to keep track of for T1, not necessarily the performance that you're going. They're back. Give me Gen G, all these type of things. Heck, not even give me a Gen G. Give me a D plus Kia. Give me a Hanwha life. You're not at that point yet, I think, even as T1. But certainly building back that momentum, building back that confidence to where you can feel, uh, you know, like you know what you're going to expect from this team heading into one of those top tier matchups. And even 
refreshing to see something like a Draven Soraka bot lane, something that has urgency, something that doesn't just feel like you're going through the motions of the meta, kind of pivoting and innovating something that hasn't been at the forefront of the meta. That's what we need to see out of Team 1. And low-key, Draven Guma is something that cooks pretty darn hot. Yeah. I love to see that champion with him. You know, uh, I, you, you heard how I felt about it with Chovy in the mid lane and how unconvinced I am. I'm the complete opposite down in the bottom lane, especially with Guma piloting them. So feeling slightly better about T1, still kind of sitting there as that fourth best team in the LCK right now. If you think the top half of the LCK is heavy on the pendulum, well, let me introduce you to the top three in the LCS who... Taking care of business uh, again this weekend. We'll start with the big boys, both um, Team Liquid and Cloud9. Uh, C9 against NRG. Yep, another 2-0. Uh, game 2 had a little bit of pushback. Or Game 1, excuse me. Game 2 had zero pushback because Berserk's getting a triple kill at level 1. Yeah, that, if you want to make sure there's no pushback in your game, get your boy Berserker that triple kill early. A, a scrim is... is not continuing after that, you know. Uh, man, I need to find out what what's the mathematical equation for the speed of light again, because apply that one to Berserker getting a triple kill early, and that is the acceleration you've got on your Kuiper carry to get through this game. Cloud9 versus NRG very much is, is a strange game in the sense of, well, one, Cloud9 does get a level up, does get a bit of a boost, does take care of their business against NRG, but it's this weird reminding and almost swapping of places of, wow, NRG was at the top last year. NRG beat G2 last year. And all of a sudden, you're getting absolutely lacked by Cloud9 in the way that they showed them in this series and how very much, even with a little bit of that pushback in that game one, I don't there was never a point that you thought this was A, probably going to go to a game three, and B, that you would say, okay, in that game three, there's a chance that they lose because there was none of that in this one from Cloud9. And, you know, talk about the mojo being back. You even got JoJo at the end of that game asking FBI, no flash? Couldn't flash the zero ulti? So he, he's feeling extra good, even though uh, he got caught out a few times in this series. That's just JoJo tradition, though. Yeah, but when JoJo gets caught out, it's just... It's just he's jokes, baiting. Man. It's a bait. That's yeah, all. Ex exactly. It's different. But uh, good to see JoJo get involved in the all chat. You know, I think that's something that people will be looking forward to when we have two teams at the very top, like a Cloud9 and like a Team Liquid with Mr. APA talking in the mid lane himself. And APA was, uh, I'm sure, chatting a little bit against Immortals. This was uh, even more dominant than the C9 one. Uh, the Tristana nerfed now and still looking pretty damn good. Yeah, there's still, there's still going to be avenues. Do I think this is going to be the champion that is still going to have the type of win rates and the type of presence that uh, that it had beforehand? No, I think that will be changed. will have somewhat of an effect, but you are going to have these type of games where you can exploit what she is so good at, what is still there. Isad here taking advantage of it full force, Team Liquid. Uh, the other top dog, the only one with the loss in FlyQuest. This was the actual... Maybe competitive series against 100 Thieves. You had Sniper absolutely popping off on Whippo in that game one. And if you were a fan of 100 Thieves, just don't watch beyond game one in this series because uh, Sniper went a little 1-9-2 and two proceeding over the next two games. And really the third game, I mean 20-2 to two in kills, it was an absolute massacre. But you got a serious level up from Masu and Busio, especially in games two and three. That's got to be the takeaway here. Well, I mean, uh, outside, of, as you laid out beforehand, the impressive game one from General Sniper, only to go com almost completely offline for games one, uh, games two and three, excuse me, later in this series. But it really is the story about the bottom lane for this FlyQuest team and how they've improved, what strides they've made, and where their contributions are coming from to make it to this point so far throughout this uh, LCS season. What we're seeing from this team, of course, you're going to know what you're going to get from Whippo and Inspired in that top side and from the jungle. You know that there, you know, maybe some a little bit of question mark, a little bit of wackiness going on and creativity, but you're certainly going to get a strong effort and performance at the least from Whippo in this top side. Inspired is going to have that type of proactivity and speed going through that jungle pace. 
and even looking at Quad in the mid lane, he has been a relatively stable uh, presence for him, even as a young player stepping into this summer split. But you go to that bottom lane of Masu and Busio and what type of strides they've made, the improvements after the debacle that was MSI and what type of, you know, again, looking at it in the positive sense where they weren't necessarily the biggest, most egregious, uh, worst of problems that they had at MSI, but certainly one that talked about the lessons and beatdowns that they did receive at MSI and what they needed to take away from them. The good news is they have taken the right things away from them and they are improving and showing those improvements out there on Summoner's Rift. Unfortunately, the low side of things, the thing that Dignitas has taken, is taking oh. Scrim Dignitas onto the main stage to help give Shopify not just their first series win, but a 2-0 series win against Dig, as it feels like Dig season is uh, coming crashing down now. This is a painful one. This is a painful one. I was all aboard the Dig Renaissance train, the... The dig gamble experience of going all in on trying to make it to worlds with the, you know, roster that they were able to assemble, it's it's not working. It's it's not working, guys. As much as I would love this to work, as much as I'd love the positive feel good stories to go around, we can individually look at this roster and we can identify, I think, two big problem points where the performance is significantly lacking. One for me, Jensen in the mid lane. I think this is someone that still very much has what it takes in the tank to be a top tier contributor for the LCS in the mid lane. I don't have to look too far to find where he was able to do that. You're not getting that type of level right now as Dignitas. And then you can go down to the bottom lane and question Zven because this was certainly something I think a lot of us were excited to see happen, see him return to the ADC position, get another opportunity. And starting out with the various games that we saw from him, this was going to be a worthwhile trip down to the bottom lane once again and to make this this type of experiment happen. Did you still think you were support Senna in this game? Yeah, you don't need to be at the forefront warding, my man. But now with four teams at one and four, I mean, Dignitas is probably still making playoffs. There's still an opportunity for a run because that's just the level of the LCS at the moment in the bottom half. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks for hanging out. We'll catch you on that flip.